Good morning, Worldwide Family. My name is Michael Williamson. And my name is Michelle Williamson. And together, we serve the, the London, London International, International Christian, Christian Church. Church. Thank you so much for tuning in this morning. It's great to have you. If you like what you see, please don't forget to subscribe. Jane and I'm from London. Hi, I'm Frankie and I'm from Devon. Hi, I'm Rachel and I'm also from London. And we want to invite you to the London, London International, International Christian Church. And I tell you what, God is reigning right now. We're going to reign with him someday in heaven. If you want to check us out, head to www.londonchurch.org.uk International Christian Church, we are so encouraged that you've chosen to worship with us this morning. You know, we are a Bible church, so we believe in Bible truths. For those who want to have a deeper Bible in the week, please contact us. We want to study the Bible with you. For those who just want to pray with someone this week, we want to pray with you as well. We're going to be singing in Jerusalem. My Lord heard Jerusalem when she mourned, when she mourned. the Bible. Some say, hey, that just ain't true. They want to get to heaven. They better turn those pages too. My Lord heard Jerusalem when she mourned, when she mourned. My Lord heard Jerusalem when she mourned, when she mourned. Some say, hey bro, that's just for you. Dum 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 dum, ba 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 dum 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 dum, ba
We're gonna be singing Jesus will fix it. Trouble come my way. Trouble come my way. Yeah, I gotta fight this time. You gotta fight this time. Oh, trouble come my way. Trouble come my way. Yeah, I gotta fight this time. You gotta fight this time. I've been calling on Jesus. Jesus is gonna fix it. I've been calling on Jesus. Try to do our best. 
best But we will understand it better by and by We're singing by and by Oh, when the morning comes All the saints all gotta gather at home And we will tell the story of how we overcome We will understand it better by and by We're singing by Hello and good morning. My name is Colby and I want to welcome you to our virtual Sunday service. I'm currently reading through the book of Luke and this morning I read in Luke chapter 11. Now Luke chapter 11 has a prayer that we're all very familiar with, which is the Lord's Prayer. But as I continued reading, I loved the story that Jesus told about a guy who goes to his friend's house at midnight, knocks on his door and asks him for food. And I can relate to this. If a brother showed up to my house at midnight asking for food, I would not be happy. I would complain, no, I'm in bed, the door's locked, Kiva, she's in bed, I can't, I can't get up, I can't help you. But I love what it says in verse eight. It says, I tell you, even though he will not get up and give you the bread because of friendship, yet because of your shameless audacity, he will surely get up and give you as much as you need. The Bible says that when we go to God with shameless audacity, when we ask him for crazy, outrageous things, he'll give them to us. And other translations of this say that he will do it for his name's sake. Because of God's character, he wants to answer our prayers. And Luke chapter 11 continues saying, what father, when his child asks him for a fish, is going to turn and give him a snake? Or if asked him for an egg, is going to turn and give him a scorpion? Now, I'm a father and I relate to this and I'm not a perfect father by any means, I got plenty of issues, but I know that I would never do something like that to my child. And understanding that God isn't gonna wanna do bad things to us, it's the opposite, he wants to do good things to us. And so I hope that you're inspired by this and by through this service, you're able to experience the character of God. You can know how much God loves you, how much God wants to provide all of your needs, your physical needs, your emotional needs, your financial needs, and most importantly, your spiritual needs. And so if we can just humble ourselves and turn our eyes to God and allow him to provide everything that we need, that's how we're able to live an abundant life that God so desires us to have. And so with that, I wanna welcome you to the London International Christian Church. Good morning, everyone. My name is Yuri Zikov, and it's an honor to pray this morning. Let's pray to our Heavenly Father. Father in heaven, thank you so much. Thank you so much for you. You are the most amazing friend. You are our Lord, you are our Savior. Thank you so much for loving us every day. We are messed up, Father, but you always love us. You always patient in us. You believe in us and you are giving us the most amazing life. We love you and we just wanna glorify you. Father, I pray that you will use the service for your glory, Father. I pray that we can really move your heart today and the heart of so many many who will listen to the service today. I pray that we glorify you in, at our workplaces, in university, Father, and absolutely every area of our life. I pray that we will seek you with all of our hearts, Father, and we that we really evangelize all the nations in Europe, Father. I pray that we can start churches all over Europe so that the light will shine everywhere. Again, thank you so much for allowing us to be your children. Thank you so much for allowing us to follow you. Please be with the service and help us to focus on everything always on you. Thank you, Father, for listening to this prayer. I wanna pray in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, amen. Good morning, 
church. My name is Shaney. This is Rachel. Together with the Sisters of Encouragement, and we're here today to bring you the announcements. Now, we all know that our God is an excellent God. And in Luke chapter 1, Jesus was born. Then in Mark chapter 7, we see that Jesus did everything well. Now, that means that Jesus was the most excellent leader of all time. Now, for us to learn how to imitate Jesus to be excellent leaders in God's movement, today, right after service at 1.30, we'll be having our leaders meeting. Now, speaking of leaders, it's so amazing to see that the kingdom of God in the first century church was advanced by mighty men. I mean, we had Paul, Peter, Timothy, James, the list goes on. And what's even more amazing is that this Wednesday, we'll be having our men's night out midweek service for the mighty men of God here in London. Now, speaking of Timothy, did you guys know that he was only 16 years old when Paul first picked him up on his second missionary journey in Acts chapter 16? Timothy and other young people have been instrumental to the movement of God. So this Friday, we'll be having our campus devotional, where instead of doing what other typical Londoners do, and what I used to do on Friday nights, I mean, drinking, drugs, that was pretty much it. At our campus devotional, we'll be having godly fun, get, getting to spend time with all the other young leaders in God's movement. But wait, there's more. On September 4th, we'll be coming together to celebrate all the incredible, excellent students who have persevered through all of their exams and their degrees and made it out the other side. Please, if you're a student and you've just graduated, please contact us. We'd love to have you. Thank you, Shaney, for those announcements. In Luke 9, it teaches us that Jesus sends out his 12 disciples that they are to proclaim about the kingdom of God and to save people by making them into disciples. And we are doing exactly that as commanded in Matthew chapter 28, where we are to make disciples. And after we make people into disciples, we baptize them. But it doesn't stop there. It says that we are to continue to teach them to obey everything Jesus commanded so that we may be presented fully mature in Christ as mentioned in Colossians chapter 1. And on September the 13th, we'll be having our new Christians orientation held at the Williamson household with the dress code of Smart Casual. It is for those who have been baptized, placed membership or restored in the past six months and also for those who haven't yet been able to attend an orientation. For more details, you can contact Michael and Maria Hart. Speaking of maturity, in Hebrews chapters 5 and 6, it says we are, move, we are to move on to maturity by learning the first principles about Christ. And it's been incredible that over the past couple of months, we have been having our first principles classes. And I just want to take this time to lift up our incredible sister, Jennifer Watkins, who oversaw our first principles classes in 2020. She is such a pillar in the London church. And it's such an honour to announce the valid Victorians of this year. Sadly, she's not able to be here, but she has asked me to read this letter. Greetings, First Principles students. First of all, congratulations on completing the First Principles class for 2020. Prayfully, you saw how valuable Micah's lessons were in solidifying and unifying our faith so that we can go out and multiply the number of disciples in the European world sector. I'm sure all of you are also extremely grateful for all the hard work and the time you put into the question and answer sessions to help you tackle those tough situations that can come up when we reach out to people and study with our friends, families and neighbours. By the fruit of everything going on in the London church recently, we can see how it's helping. We are proud of each and every one of you. However, as with any class, we need to draw special recognition to those who by their hard work and study exceeded the results of everyone in the class. In the US, these people are known as the valedictorians. And this year we want to honor the top male and female students of the class. For the women, the valedictorian is our own dear sister, Dr. Adeshola Bello, who though baptized less than a year ago, used the intellect owned at Imperial College to be the clear choice. Her goal is now to go out and use what she has learned to baptize many, especially women like herself at Imperial. For the men, 
It was a tougher battle, with the position going back and forth between a few individuals week to week. However, in the end, it came down to the final exam grade and the valedictorian is our own region leader of the South, Casper Tambour, who has definitely been using what he has been learning to grow in, in the mighty extreme South region over the past few weeks. Onward and upward for God's glory, everyone. Very proud of you all, Jen Watkins. So congratulations to our valedictorians. And with that, we will now take a three minute fellowship break.
In order to prepare our hearts for communion, we're going to be singing, O Lord, our Lord. Hmm. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent thy name, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Who has set thy glory among the heavens? Will praise thy holy name forever, evermore. Oh, we will praise thy name forevermore. How excellent thy glorious name. Oh, we will praise thy name forevermore. How excellent thy We'll praise and magnify we will praise thy name forevermore. forevermore. We will praise thy name we'll forevermore. Lord and magnify we will thy magnify holy name, name forevermore. forevermore. Oh Lord, we will praise thy name forevermore. How excellent thy glorious name. Oh, we will praise thy name forevermore. How excellent thy name. We'll praise and magnify. We will praise thy name forevermore. We will praise thy name forevermore. And magnify thy holy name forevermore. We will praise thy holy name forever. We will Lord and magnify thy name forevermore. We will praise thy holy name forever. We will Lord and magnify thy name forevermore. Forevermore, forevermore, amen and amen. Good morning, church. My name is Abhishek, and I'm a student at Oxford Brooks. I'm studying Masters in Architecture. And uh, I'm being trained uh, at the church f uh, to be full-time evangelist. I'm so fired up to be, uh, be working for the Lord. And today I have been uh, given a privilege to share uh, um, my, my lovely sister Victoria, what cross means to her. And she asked me to read a scripture. Let's look at Romans chapter 5. In verse 6, it says, You see, at, the, at just at the right time, when we still powerless Christ who died for ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person. Through for a good person, some, someone might possibly be dared to die. But God demonstrated his own love for us in this. While we still sinners, Christ died for us. I give you my lovely sister Victoria. Good morning, brothers and sisters. Today, I have the privilege of sharing with you what the cross means to me. So, I grew up in West London in a very sheltered household where pretty much everything was at my disposal. My parents are Polish immigrants and they worked extremely hard to ensure that both me and my sister thrived. It was about at the age of 13 that I started noticing the trap of mediocrity and I didn't want to conform to social norms. And so I started, I started studying very hard and quickly became top of my class. At the same time, I also started reading books about philosophy and became aware of the concept of yin and yang from Taoism, which is just a synonym for light and darkness or order and chaos. After this very quickly, I became obsessed with the concept of control. This spiraled down dangerously as one day I just decided to completely stop eating and fell into anorexia and was soon at the verge of getting osteoporosis, which is a condition where your bones start crumbling. My life quickly became very ritualistic and I was exercising heavily three times a day to the point where my hair was falling off my head and my skin was turning yellow because my liver was failing. Despite all these health complications, I managed to secure myself a place at the University of St Andrews to study medicine. Before university, my mental health was just going completely downhill, but 
when I entered university, it was like falling off a cliff. Suddenly, I was surrounded by the most intelligent students, the most brightest students, and my worst nightmare of becoming mediocre had finally become true. In my first year, I basically just spent my whole year surrounded by social media. I spent so many hours procrastinating, just browsing Snapchat and Instagram and Facebook, wasting so much time. But in my second year, I just had enough of being depressed and I turned to emotional eating. Very quickly, I gained a lot of weight and this turned into a very vicious cycle where I would eat to make myself feel better for some instant gratification. And then I would feel disgusted in myself. I would just feel fat. I hated looking at myself in the mirror and it would just go all the way back to step one, back to eating and then back to feeling disgusted in myself. Every single day, I just felt like a victim. I felt like everybody else in the world had it better off than I did. I was wondering, wondering why did God save me from so many other things? I mean, still to this day, I've never drank a drop of alcohol in my life. I've never taken a drug. I never smoked a cigarette. But why was I stuck with this horrible curse of an eating disorder? Why was I addicted to food? So it wasn't actually until I became a disciple that I realized that I'm not the only person that suffers. Everybody, every single person in the world suffers and it's for a reason. It's because God just wants to put tests in our lives to see what we turn to. Do we turn to God or do we turn to worldly desires like food or alcohol or drugs or whatever it may be for you? It's also when I realized that prayer is not just a coping mechanism like what we learned at university. It's a shield against temptation. It's the only long-term solution there is. And it was during quarantine, just going back to my story, it was during quarantine that I reached my emotional threshold and I was just honestly done with life. I was so depressed. I had depression and anxiety at the same time. I just completely reached the lowest point I've ever reached in my whole entire life. And it was at this point where God looked down at me and, and God had mercy on me. And on the 22nd of June, 2020, he sent down two disciples my way. When I was walking, strolling through Acton Park, I met Chanel and Rachel. And this is the first picture that we ever, the first selfie that we ever took together. So I'd just like to share again, Romans chapter five, verses six to eight, which is the scripture that really, really inspires me and relates to my life. You see, just at the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So I love it the concept of it being the right time, that God saved us at the right time, God died for us at the right time. I think of this because time is something that is completely beyond our control. We don't understand time, I don't understand time. And before I became a disciple, I was trying to conquer time. I was trying to set up all my own rules, trying to set up my schedule, just trying to create this utopian order in my mind that is just not possible. And then it was once I started studying the Bible that I saw that the Bible is the physical manifestation of order. It was what I was always searching for. And now I, I've realized that I don't need to worry anymore about what time I need to eat, what time I need to pray, the right time to pray, the right time to share my faith, there being a right time to have another quiet time. Because for me, the right time is always the now. Through prayers, I've recognized and I've asked, I've asked God for wisdom. And God has told me that, God has given me so much wisdom that the problem with me is that I just always make excuses. There's always an excuse. I'm always just procrastinating. There's always something that I know that I should be doing, but I don't do it just because of my own worldly sorrow. I always delay. And I recognize that this is not just at the cost of my own health, but also at the cost of my own salvation and the salvation of other lost lives, which are still out there, still waiting to be saved. So all in all, for me, the cross means order. 
The cross means truth and the cross means being freed from being a slave of my own mind. Let's bow our head in praise. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for today, Father. Thank you for giving us Victoria, Father. Thank you, Father, for saving her soul, Father. Thank you for giving her just game changer baptism, Father. Thank you for her, uh, her zeal, her passion for you, Father. Thank you for bringing her to the kingdom, Father. Thank you for saving her life, Father. I pray for all the people who are listening today, Father. I pray for more Victoria, Victoria to come to our church, Father. I pray for uh, more souls and more life who are, hungry, who are hungry for satisfaction, who are looking for truth, Father. They come to you, Father. Uh, because this is the only church. This is the only truth, Father. I pray for uh, the rest of the day in your son Jesus' name. I pray. Amen. There's a sweet, sweet spirit in this place. And I know that is the Spirit of the Lord. There are sweet expressions on each face. And I know that is the presence of the Lord. Sweet Holy Spirit, sweet heavenly dove, stay right here with us. Filling us with your love And for each blessing We lift our hearts in praise Without a doubt we'll know That we have been revived When we shall leave This place Good morning church, my name is Abhishek and I have a privilege to share about contribution today. Money and position are the second most uh, referred topic in the Bible. Money is mentioned 800 times in the Bible. Love is mentioned 530 times in the Bible. Faith is mentioned 485 times in the Bible. So the charge of today's um, contribution is giving attracts favor of God. Let's turn our Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. In verse 8, it reads, And God is able to make all grace abound you, so that all things at all times, having that you need, you will abound in every good work. Grace is the favor of God. Uh, so this text basically refers to people who give. Uh, people who give a lot can expect a lot of favor from God. In other words, faith is something which money cannot buy. Uh, right now, we, most of us are in a situation where we don't deserve to have, where we, where we don't know why we are over here. It's just the grace of God. The purpose of Christian life is to give what we have, what we have received. And gospel is the only story where a hero gives his own life for a villain. And uh, while we were still slave of sin, Jesus Christ died for us. But the more important thing is to give to Lord with a right heart. And God asks us to give cheerfully. And the Greek word of cheerfully means uh, hilariously. And it's funny that God asks us to give uh, hilariously. So sisters, do, uh, do, you give the God, uh, do, you, uh, do you give to God with the same level of happiness when you go for shopping, 
when you have a, when you buy a new dress uh, from Zara, do you have the same level of happiness when you give to God? Uh, because actions speak louder than the words. In other words, we can say that uh, the purpose of heart can be seen by what they do, not what they what they say. Your giving should be uh, should be to God uh, in a cheerful way. In, in, uh, not not uh, your God, giving should be in 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 the words to love God, not to uh, not in a way of bondage, uh, because God, we as a Christian are meant to follow Christ, and He gave His life cheerfully, and. God bless us in so many ways. So many of you have got different promotion. Not so many of you have got uh, admission of so many different uh, university in Oxford uh, University, and so many of you have uh, things have lasted for long, so so that you don't have to pay for the repair. And when I think about my life, I gave uh, like honestly, I got so much stuff from God. I was supposed to pay fourteen hundred uh, for my accommodation accommodation fees. But I pray to God, God, I don't know what, what should I do. I want to give for you to, for a special mission. And just after three days, I receive a mail from my university that I have to pay only 350 pounds. And I got a huge discount for my university. And there's so many stories regarding that. And sometimes spiritually, we pray to God that, uh, God, we, we need money to buy this, buy that. God, please help us to buy what we need. But God, what God tried to say is that you don't need what you are praying for. I'm trying to take away those things from your life. I'm not, uh, I'm not uh, punishing you, but I'm protecting you because I don't, I don't want you to have the, the thing which you want to have in your life. And so many times we pray to God, God help us to direct our life. And what God, when God tries to direct our life, when he uh, finally take a charge in our life and we're like, God, we prayed, we fasted for those things, but we didn't got it. And God is like, ah, oh, this guy. Um, even the richest person on the earth cannot have, doesn't have enough money to, um, to get a God grace, God favor. But you have. So don't waste your grace. Sometimes God bless us spiritually that all, all our worldly desire to have stuff which we don't have, it's been gone away. Uh, so when I think about Michael and Michelle, so they recently got robbed. All their car, their, their jewelry was not there. But they were flat fired up because the, the robber couldn't steal the, the most valuable and those most precious things, which is the salvation, their faith. So, and when I think about uh, Michael, he sold his car, he sold his house. house. He, and because of that, what he received, he gave. Because of that, we are alive. We are, we are just talking, you are looking at me because of that. I'm alive because of that. So God asked us to not only receive, but to give what we, he has given to us. Uh, because God blessing is like a channel. Uh, when we look at an example of a river and a pond, a pond water is so stinky and you cannot drink it. You cannot drink from that water because uh, it doesn't give life. It just kills you because it's just storing water. And when you think about river, it just it's flowing because it's just passing the water. And the river gives you life. It gives you uh, so it is it's fresh. And um, so I have a, in closing, I have a challenge for you guys. Most of you are fasting. Most of you have a challenge of 35 days and most of you have cut down your sugar and a lot of things. So I'm going to challenge you. So whatever you are saving from, whatever you are uh, saving a little from, just give it to God. Every, every week, give it to God. That little thing, that live in saving, give it to God. And you will be like, what, what's going to happen with this little thing? How God's going to get, you know, benefit with this? How's going to church grow with this little thing? But let me tell you something. God doesn't look the sum. Doesn't look. God loves little. God doesn't see what you're giving. God see your heart. So, uh, because God, because uh, giving attracts the favor of God. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for today, Father. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to uh, speak about contribution, Father. Father, I want to thank you for everything which you have given to me, Father. Everything which you have given to us, the church, the, 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 uh, the new life, Father, the, the faith, the salvation, Father. There's so many things which we cannot have with the money, Father. When I think about people who have so much of in the world, but they don't have you, Father. When I think about this thing in my life, if I have everything in the world, if I don't have you, I will be blank. I will be in darkness, Father. Father, thank you for being there for me. Thank you for loving me, Father. Help us to be what you want us to be, Father, not what we want to be, Father. I pray for the rest of the day in your son Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. We'll be
be singing coming up Lord I'm coming up Lord I'm coming up soon I'm coming up Lord I want to hear my name name I want to hear my name name if you read your Before we hear the word of God preached, we're going to be singing, Our God, He is Alive. There is beyond the eyes of blue A God concealed from human sight He did disguise with heavenly hue And framed the world with His great might There is a God, He is Alive A God whose voice the prophets heard He is a God that we should know Who speaks from His inspired word There is a God, God. He is alive alive. In Him we live live. and we survive From dust our God From dust our God God holds the germ within his hand Though men may search they cannot find For God alone does understand There is a God, God. he is alive alive. In him we live live. and we survive survive. From dust our God, from dust our God Son upon a tree, 
a life was willing there to give that he from sin might set men free and evermore in him could live there is a god he is alive in him we live and we survive from dust our god from dust our god created man he is our god The title of the lesson is, It's Time. It's time. Turn to Hosea chapter 10. Hosea chapter 10. Of course, you say, bro, it's time. It's time for what? Well, maybe it's time to cancel, cancel culture in the 20th century right there, 21st century. You know, I, I do believe that uh, it is time to cancel, cancel culture. It's time for us to stop letting the progressive media tell us what's offensive. Only God Almighty can tell us. What's offensive? You say, bro, maybe it's time to stop virtue signaling. <laughs> well, the word of God in Matthew 6 verse 14 says, don't announce your good deeds as if you are a good person. We know the only thing good is God alone. You say, you say maybe, maybe, maybe it's time. It's time for the fathers to start taking charge of the homes and really teaching their children what it means to follow the word of God. And for others out there, the political out there, you say, well, maybe it's time for us to focus on the U.S. election. And yet it only matters if Jesus Christ is, dare we say, the president of your heart. If Jesus Christ is governing your life, the title of today is it's time. And yet Hosea tells us in chapter 10 and verse 12, he says, so righteousness for yourselves. Reap the fruit of unfailing love. And we know unfailing love only comes from that which doesn't fail, God Almighty. He says, and break up your unplowed ground, for it's time to seek the Lord. I mean, Hosea discusses it's time to seek God. And yet that's what it's about today. You know, I'm so excited about so many that have come to the waters of baptism through seeking God. Of course, we remember literally just last week, our sister Cindy got baptized. The week before that, we had three come to the waters of baptism. Dario's sister, Fiona, got baptized. Thomas on the east side over there, not doubting Thomas, but dare we say dying Thomas, dying to himself and becoming a Christian. Thomas got baptized. Francis got baptized in the north right there. And then even a week before that, Palvi got baptized. You know, there are so many that are seeking God. I pray you are seeking God as we are looking at the word of God today. Turn to Luke chapter one. We're still studying out the book of Luke because it's time. <laughs> it's time you really see what Luke the doctor had to say to us. And I think about I think about it, you know, I think about the principle of time. I think about, wow, what, what if all the power went out? <laughs> what, if, what if God Almighty said, you know, it's time I just shut all the power down? Or the government agent said, it's time we just, we just shut all the power down. Can you imagine? No way. I know the campus students would struggle right there. <laughs> no Instagram. <laughs> no phones. No electricity. Can you imagine if there was absolutely no light? If some power shut down all the light in the world, that's exactly what happens when you shut down God's church. 
That's exactly what happens when you say you can't meet and worship God. You shut down the spiritual power grid right there. And yet the Bible is very clear that we are the light of the world. You know, it, it, it's a dangerous thing to try and shut down God's church, to try and shut down God's message. And we know Satan knows it is time for him to start because his time is short as it relates to Revelation chapter 12. You know, this whole phrase, it's time, is there we say a catchphrase. I'm, I'm, I'm reminded of Michael Buffer, the guy who announces the, 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 the heavyweight championship of the world. And he always just says, let's get ready to rumble. <laughs> and he announces that, and it's become this catchphrase for getting into, dare we say, the heavyweight championship of the world. Well, his, his younger brother has coined a phrase that's just as popular in the ultimate fighting championship, the UFC. And of course, this phrase is not, let's get ready to rumble. This phrase is, it's time. He literally gets $10,000, 10000 U.S. dollars every time he makes the statement. He's made, he's, oh, he's worked over $10 million U.S. dollars simply by saying it's time. By using the statement, it's time. And yet Jesus is our heavyweight champion. We know the word glory means heavyweight. Jesus is the glory of God. Jesus is the heavyweight champion. We know Jesus is the ultimate fighting championship. He overcame death and the grave at the cross. And you can overcome death if you are with Jesus. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 17. Jesus is our ultimate fighting championship. The fight is fixed. It is time. Luke chapter 1. Luke chapter 1. It says, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. You know, Luke, Luke comes onto the scene and says he was an eyewitness. He, 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 he just really, or not he was an eyewitness, but he, he interviewed the eyewitnesses to really get an accurate account of what God was saying to his people. And you know what's so important when you think about the whole principle of time? You know, for me, I always think about, hey, it is time for me to seek God. It's time for me to get closer to God. And yet there's online, there's this, there's this incredible, incredible tool called the World Death Clock. It teaches that two people die every second. But what's more challenging is not only does it teach how many people die every second, it teaches when you will die. You literally can go in and type in your name, your address, your birthday, and it can predict when you will die. Does that inspire you today? <laughs> Do you know? Well, no, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. Well, let me tell you something. We all are going to die. <laughs> so it shouldn't shock you. We all share a common destiny. We all are going to die. The, the problem isn't that we die. It's, it's what happens when we die. Do we go to heaven? Do we go to hell? You know, I, I got a, had a great Bible study this week with a gentleman. He said, you know, I don't want to go to any churches. None of them teach on 2 Peter chapter 2, which teaches that you're going to go to hell. None of them teach on Matthew chapter 24, which teaches Jesus is coming back. None of them teach all, do, does your church believe in all of this? I said, Peter, you watch on Sunday, and I will challenge you. Not only do we believe it, we believe we need to be living a life that shows that we are true disciples, and we want to get into your life and find out whether you are going to heaven or hell. Peter, if you are watching, the question is, are you going to heaven or are you going to hell? We can't worry about the other churches. It's time for us personally to seek after God. Luke is so powerful as he writes this account here. He's so powerful because he, he just says he got it from the eyewitnesses. And when I think about that world death clock, I go, wow, it, it'd be pretty daunting to type in those dates. You know, one, one preacher did it and he typed in Tiger Woods and it says, October 11th, 2049 will be the last day that Tiger Woods lives. He typed in Tom Hanks. April 20th, 2030 will be the last day that Tom Hanks lives. He typed in Donald Trump, of all people. And it was March 25th, 2020, where Donald Trump was supposed to be going. Well, he's still living, so that was wrong right there. God's given a little bit more time. And yet I think about this, I go, it's not about all these, uh, these celebrities. It's about us knowing that it is time to be right with God. And what would it say if we typed in our own, our own date. You know, I think about some of the incredible, incredible ways God has proven himself. I think about the 1800s, right after the Victorian era here in England. And I think about a gentleman by the name of Sir William Ramsey, an archaeologist, a biblical skeptic, someone who's, I don't, I don't believe in this whole Jesus, this whole God thing. He's taught, he taught at the University of Edinburgh, 
And he believed, although the Bible had many facts in it, he believed the Bible was completely phony and false. So he says, hey, I'm an archaeologist. I know exactly what I will do. I will just attack the two New Testament books in the Bible that have the most archaeological uh, sites there. I'll just attack those two books. And of course, the two books that have the most archaeological sites, the most, the most geographical locations in the entire New Testament are the book of Acts and the book of Luke. So he attacks the book of Acts. He attacks the book of Luke. And as he goes to each one of the digs, he, he, he starts not only leaving his atheism, he becomes a Gnostic, he becomes a theist. And before you know it, he becomes arguably one of the most radical apologists for Jesus. An Englishman who went from atheism to evangelism. Dare we say, Sir William Ramsey, will we have Sir Luke Snow? Will we see Sir Chris Worth? Or are you an Englishman that really wants to take the time to investigate like Luke did? And to go to those who did detailed autopsy. You know, you look at this word here. It says in Luke chapter one, just as they were handed down to us by those from the first who were eyewitnesses and servants. The word eyewitness in Greek is autopsy. It's the Greek word for eyewitnesses. It's where we get the word autopsy. He says, I went to those who did an autopsy, who really, who really did an autopsy. And then the next word, it says, and they were also eyewitnesses, auto, uh, uh, eyewitnesses and servants. The word servants is the Greek word hutari. It means an under rower. The word under rower is a medical term. It means an intern. Luke says, I went to the interns to write this account. You know, if you're an intern, you got to be fired up that it is time for people to come to you to get the account of what it means to be a sold out disciple from the interns. Are you with me here, church? Point number one, it's time to offer prayers that God will answer. It is time not just to say any old thing. It's time to offer prayers that God Almighty will answer. You know, you hate when you pray and then God doesn't answer. Why don't we offer prayers? We know that God will answer. You know, as we dig into this, the first it's awesome how Luke does this. He proves a lot of things to us. The first four verses, these right here, we look at Luke chapter one, all the way down to chapter four. The first four verses of Luke's gospel are actually one sentence in the whole, in the Greek language. And they are written in refined, academic, classical style. But the rest of the entire gospel of Luke is written, dare we say, in the language of the streets. So Luke is saying, hey, listen, I'm educated, but I want to I want to let you know at the outset, I'm smart. <laughs> I'm a doctor, but I'm going to write God's message in the language of the common man. If you are just a common man, if you are just working class, as they say here, this is written for you. Luke says, hey, I can relate to all types from the beginning. And of course, he goes to the interns, the ones who were interns of the great physician, Jesus Christ. And then we remember down in verse eight that Zechariah prayed from last week. It says, once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the, imp to the temple of the Lord and to burn incense. Now you gotta understand, every male priest, every male, or not every male priest, but every male that was born in the Old Testament under Aaron was a priest. So that was literally Everybody. So at this particular time, they say that there were 18,000 to 24,000 priests at the time. Wouldn't it be awesome if you got all these priests and you get chosen? <laughs> you got all these people and you're the one that God picks. You know, if you're a disciple, isn't it awesome to know you were chosen? That God handpicked you to offer incense, to burn incense to God Almighty? And of course, the challenging thing is all 18,000 priests they were kind of itinerant priests. They would go here, they would go there, they work in the temple. They were very autonomous. Isn't it amazing that we have priests, we have disciples who aren't autonomous, who aren't like during the time of, of, of Zechariah that worked independently. We have priests that work together. Isn't it awesome where you go, wow, it's time I'm part of a church that works together. So Zechariah gets chosen and he goes on and you got to understand you walk into, you first of all, to be chosen, that was huge. And then he walks on into the temple. 
And he walks on in and, and, you know, he's thinking about in the Old Testament when those guys walked into the temple and got killed. And and he's just like, wow, I can't believe I'm the one guy. Everybody outside is wondering why they hadn't been picked. He walks on into the temple. On the left side, you got the Monero right there. That's the seven branch, solid gold, hundred pound or seven stone candlestick holder right there called the Monero. You got that right there. On your right side, you got what I call Christian carbohydrates. You got there, we say the showbreads on the right seat in the Old Testament right there, because we're still in the Old Testament. John's the last Old Testament prophet. You still had, it was okay to eat some carbs right there. It doesn't help me out nowadays, but that's just for me right there. So you got, you got on the left, you got the, you got the, you got the, uh, you got the, you got the Monero. On the right, you got the showbread and he walks on in. And remember in the Old Testament, you had two prayers, one in the morning, one at night. There were sin offerings. You had to pray for your sin in the morning. You had to offer a sacrifice for sin in the morning and a sin at night. We sin day and night. We need God. So there were the two sin offerings, the two prayers. And then there was also the drink offering. Next, the priest would walk into the temple. And so Zachariah would walk on in there and he would take a little pinch of, 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 of incense right there and he'd place it on the altar and he would come out fired up and he would say, and he would give the priestly benediction. He would say, the Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. You are awesome. But when Zechariah comes out, we find out what he says in Luke chapter one, verse 22. It says when he comes out, it says in verse 22, when he came out, he could not speak. <laughs> they realized he had seen a vision in the temple for it kept making signs to them, but remained. <laughs> he couldn't say, it. you know, sometimes that's what happens when, 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 when you have a divine interaction with God. You can't even say nothing. He's like, oh my goodness, I can't believe it. Now, he was to offer incense. So I'm, 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 I'm sure he offered prayers to have this this child, because later on it says, your prayers have been heard. So that's how we know he did pray for, for, for a son. But he offers incense at the golden altar. I pray you're offering prayers at the golden altar. I really believe you got to pray hardest when it's hardest to pray. You got to pray hardest when it's hardest to pray. I mean, remember, 400 years of silence, 400 years of no God. God going silent, praying to be fruitful, and he's still, he's still praying. I'm sure it was hard to pray, but you got to pray hardest when it's hardest to pray. And I'm sure there was an, an emotional thing. You know, oftentimes we live in a, in a, in a time where there, there are a lot of challenges we have growing up, at least so we think. You know, I talked to one individual who says, you know, I, I was emotionally abandoned by my mother. And I said, well, you know how you, know how you heal? From an emotionally absent mother, an emotionally absent father, you pray. That's how you heal. You pray. You don't need Prozac. You don't need drugs. You don't need to be told you're crazy. You don't need to be told you got some disease. You pray. You get emotionally attached to the God who doesn't change. And yet I believe the greatest tragedy is not unanswered prayers. The greatest tragedy for a true disciple is unoffered prayers. That's a tragedy. When you got God Almighty waiting to hear, waiting to see, waiting to smell those sweet incense right there, because they got to be sweet. In Exodus chapter 30, we look at the Old Testament kind of parallel to this. In Exodus 30, verse 7, it says, Aaron must burn fragrant incense on the altar. But the King James Version, King James, England, amen. The King James Version right there says, Aaron must burn sweet incense on the altar. Every morning, when he tends the lamps, he must burn incense again when he lights the lamps at twilight. So the incense will burn regularly before the Lord for generations to come. He says every generation needs to pray. The incense got to burn every generation. Don't offer on the altar any other incense or the King James Version says any strange incense, any strange prayers. He says your prayers better be sweet. Your prayers better not be strange. Don't offer any strange incense or any burnt offering or grain offering and do not pour a drink offering on it. Of course, the whole reference to prayer or incense is prayer, right? He says, you, you got to pray and it can't be strange prayers. It can't be, it's, it's, first of all, it can't be, it's got to be sweet. You can't have these bitter prayers. How's your prayer life? Has prayer made you stop sinning or has sin made you stop praying? You know, he says, you got to have sweet prayers. God, you are Awesome. I love that in Philippians. It says, pray to God with thanksgiving. You know, if you don't pray with some thanksgiving in your heart and they're not those sweet, grateful, gratifying prayers where God smells that aroma and it just smells amazing. 
What? I said, oh, that smells like, whoa, that smells bitter. Woo. What is that? Oh, that smells so unfaithful. Woo. That is not a sweet aroma. We got to have sweet prayers. We got to have awesome. We can't have strange prayers. Strange prayers. You know, I, I talked to one individual. He said, you know, uh, Jesus is the God of all religions. I go, no, he is not. He's not the God of all religions. Jesus is the God of the only religion. See, there's only two religions, the right one and the wrong one. And today, if you're watching, you are either following the right God or not God. See, Jesus is Lord of all. He's not Lord at all. A strange prayer is when we think Jesus is Lord of all other gods. He's over them, but they're not gods. So Jesus is not, we can't be said, God, I pray, get the God of all religions. There's no God of all religions. One religion, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. We can't have any strange prayers. You know, there are certain churches that teach that you can speak in tongues. The Bible is very clear in the book of Luke, in the book of Acts, rather, that speaking in tongues are known languages. These are strange prayers. There's no purpose for speaking in tongues in the 21st century. There's no, no, no purpose in, in, in getting up there and, and, and mama say, mama say, mama goose. I mean, that's strange to God, right? It's strange to us and it's strange to God. It will not help your marriage. We can't offer strange. No, there's another thing that's a strange prayer. To pray for open people. You don't ever find that in the Bible. It says pray for the workers. God's like, that's strange. People are open. You need to be praying for yourself, the workers. <laughs> we can't be offering strange prayers right there. We can't be offering strange prayers. Now remember, when he walked on in, he went past the holies and then the holiest of holies and got to the most holy place, the closest place to the presence of God. And then he offered his incense. You know, God is telling us through Luke, you are closest to God when you're praying. And it's time for us to believe that, that you are closest to God when you're praying to God. Psalm 114, verse one through two says, may my prayer be counted as incense before you. The lifting up my hands as the evening, of, we lift up our hands when we're not mad. <laughs> That's why he says, lift up holy hands, you know, with, you know, like holy hands, not fists, not holy hands right there. In Revelation five, verse eight, it says, when he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each one holding a harp and a golden bowl full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. He says the angels have a bowl of your prayers. If you're praying. And if you're praying prayers that God will answer. What do you need for incense? You need fire. You need fire for the incense to be useful. God is waiting for fiery prayers. I love our brother Chris Worth. His prayers sound like sermons. <laughs> he just starts praying right there, just offering a fiery prayers. Some of us are too cool to pray. And that's why they're not on fire. You're too cool to pray. Incense needed to be beaten and pounded before they were used, before the powder could be used on the altar. You know, sometimes you need to be beaten by the world. You need to be pounded by your sins before you decide to pray a prayer that God will answer. We're going to get to that. And of course, I already hit it, but sweet prayers, not bitter prayers. We can't be offering those bitter prayers to God. He'll, he'll hear it, but we need sweet incense right there. Now look at verse 62 in chapter one. I'm just grazing back over this. Give us a running start here. Luke one, verse 62. I hope you guys are still with me. He says this. He says, when they made signs to his father, of course, this is after Zachariah's prayer gets answered, the birth of John the Baptist. He has the baby. God always answers his promise. They were promised a kid. They got a kid. Didn't happen in, all, in, in their time, but it happened in God's time. God's always right on time. And so then after that, it says in verse 62, it says, then they made the signs to the father to find out what he would name the child. Uh, he asked for a writing tablet and to everyone's astonishment, he wrote, his name is Zachariah II. No, he says, John. <laughs> he says, no, this guy is special. <laughs> he says, John, immediately his mouth was open and his tongue was loose and he began to speak praising who? God. He starts praising God, it says right here. Now remember, God hadn't even come on the scene yet. Jesus hadn't even come on the scene yet. Zachariah is praising God. And of course, the other thing, and I'll hit that in a second. The other thing is Zachariah is speaking now. He's speaking. Um, the comical thing is, if you read earlier, he, he, his, we just read it, he was, he was quiet. He wasn't quiet for a week or two weeks. He didn't get a chance to speak until his wife had to, nine months of silence. 
He was silent for nine months, which means he had to listen to his wife. You know, if you're a, a, a brother and you're married, Sometimes it's just time for you to listen to your wife. Zachariah had to listen to his wife for nine months. You know, I'm so fired up about all the brothers that are going to be married and that have gotten recently married. And I, I love Luke Snow, and, and he's going to be married to the, 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 the beautiful uh, Frankie. Uh, I call her Frankie Snow. I, I, I thought it was a, a slip, but I guess it was prophetic. Uh, she will be Frankie Snow soon. Uh, but, but, but Luke understands, or at least he will in our first session this Saturday, you got to listen to your wife. You got to listen. You don't have to agree with everything. Amen, wives. But you do, as brothers, got to listen to your wife. Zachariah had to listen for nine months. I don't know if I could do that one, but that's pretty special. He had radical faith. And then, of course, Zachariah finally speaks. God gives him a second chance. You know, we serve the God of second chances. The first time he didn't have enough faith to speak. Remember, we talked last week. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians, hey, I have believed, therefore I speak. He comes out of the temple and he speaks. You know, we got to come out of services. We got to come out of Sunday services and preach the word of God. We can't just be silent. We're only silent when we don't re really believe what we heard. That's when we're silent. And yet God gives him a second chance to speak. And of course he speaks. He had to listen for nine months right there, uh, but he speaks. And so it's time uh, for us to get loud about God. Remember, God had been silent for 400 years and now God is speaking. He's speaking through a Gabriel. He's speaking through Elizabeth. He's speaking through Mary. He's speaking through Zacharias. And yet the question once again, is it time for God to speak through you? I think so. That's what I believe. I go, God, it's time for, it's time for, 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 for you to speak through me. It's time for you to be, be heard through me. Not in London, in Europe. Not only in Europe, in the entire world. In the entire world. I want God's voice to be heard through me. Has God been silent in your life? You know, we have four great regions. And I, I just want to ask the regions. Is God taking the rest over there in the West? Is he silent? Is he speaking? Is he speaking in Bible talk? Is he speaking in discipleship time? Are you putting sermons together for your discipleship partners? Is, are you speaking the word out or has COVID made you have a social distance from God? Is God taking a rest in the West? Has God shut his mouth down in the South? <laughs> has he gone silent down there? Has he gone silent? I, I, I hope there's not a bunch of yeast over there in the East that we are really speaking out about God because God's message has got to be Released. You know, I was told, you know, some brothers and sisters are just not growing. You know, you're not growing. You're dying. You're dying. If you're not. It, can you imagine something's not growing? Can you imagine a little kid is not growing? All the other kids grow and this kid doesn't grow. There's a disease for it. It's wrong. Can you imagine if one part of your body stops growing? <laughs> you know, you got you got arms. You got like, you got like this uh, abnormal growth right here. Not the best looking church. I don't think Jesus has a church where, you know, got an arm here. So the whole church has got to grow. Let me tell you something. I'm going after growth. You got. Are you growing? East side. Some of you got baptized a long time ago. Haven't seen you baptize anybody. Haven't heard from you. Very quiet. Are you growing? Is God silent? Is it north go forth or north no force? God's got to be loud. We can't say, well, God's speaking a little bit. He's whispering. No, no, he's got to be loud. <laughs> he came out praising God, speaking. And in verse 67, it says he praised the Lord. It says his father Zechariah is filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm proud pray, in verse 68, brother. Praise be to the Lord. Praise be to the Lord. I think this is comical because Jesus hadn't come into the scene yet. So what's the point? Zechariah knew less about Jesus than you and I, but he praised God. He praised God. He knew he was coming, but he hadn't come. He said, praise God. I knew he was coming. Praise God. He didn't even know what we know. There's no excuse not to praise God. It is time for us to pray prayers that God will answer. You say, well, what are, okay, bro, you got me. What are the prayers that God will answer? I surrender all. When was the last time you prayed that one? God, it's time for me to, not for me to surrender in dating. We love to pick out where we want to be surrendered. If you're not totally surrendered, you're not totally surrendered. You can't be like surrendered in dating but not surrendered in, in, in ministry. Surrendered with my school, but not surrendered. Surrendered with, 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 with evangelism, but not surrendered with persecution. If you're not surrendered, you're not surrendered. A prayer God will answer is God, I surrender all. 
Help align my heart with your will. I surrender all. Pick out who you want me to marry. Pick out where you want me to go. Pick out where, I know it's probably silent. I know we got the virtual thing, but you're probably silent at home. But pick out, God, I surrender all. You surrender all, God goes, woo. You got my attention. It's about time. You surrendered all. You know, of course, there's the story of the super wealthy man. This guy's got so much money. He dies um, and he's got houses and cars and money. And they go to his lawyer and they go, well, how much did he leave behind? This guy was super rich. And the lawyer goes, all of it. We can't take nothing to heaven. Doesn't matter how much you got. You got to surrender it all now. You got to surrender it all. You know, if you pray for the kingdom to come, that's a prayer God will answer. God, I pray your kingdom comes here in my section of the world. I pray your kingdom comes in Germany, Poland. I pray your kingdom comes. That's a prayer God will answer. God, forgive me, mold me. God, lead me. <laughs> That's a prayer that God will answer. God, forgive me. God, mold me. God, lead me. God, give me wisdom. I don't know what to do. Give me wisdom. He says, anyone likes it wisdom, he should pray. That's a prayer God will answer. Now, he may give you problems, which gives you wisdom because you figure it out through those problems. I've learned that one. Give me wisdom. And I get a bunch of problems. Thanks, God. But I learned exactly what to do and what not to do. Wisdom is one of those prayers. And then lastly, God, use me. Use me. Not use me where I want you to use me. Use me, as they say here in England, full stop. Or in America, period. Use me. Not use me, you know, you know I'm Nigerian. I've got to marry a Nigerian. You know, I'm white. I got to marry someone white, right? I'm, I'm Asian. I got to marry Asian. I don't know. I can't. They're, they're true. No, no, no. Just use me. Just use me. Use me, period. Use me. Just use me. Use me, God. Use me today, God. Use me in D time, God. Use me in the sermon, God. Use me at work, God. Use me in the school, God. Use me with my family, God. Use me, God. Please use me. You're the only one who can use me and it be from love because the world will abuse me. Use me. It's time. We offer prayers that God will answer. Are you praying prayers God will answer? He'll answer if you give him the right prayers. He will answer. And we see he answered. Zechariah. Let's keep moving. Number two, Jesus came at the right time. Jesus came at the right time. Of course, we always got to submit to God's time. You say, well, when did Jesus come? Well, we don't know exactly. Don't get sucked into the world tells you he was born on May 20, or, or December 25th. He actually wasn't. The last recorded date that's recorded by one of the church fathers uh, by the name of Clement of Alexandria, uh, uh, recorded in his book, uh, Stromata, says that Jesus was born on May 20th. That's pretty cool. My son was born on May 21st. Uh, so that's pretty cool that you can be born. If you're a May baby, you were born in a, now that gives, that's a lot of pressure right there. If you're born, it's like, man, I'm born in the month of Jesus. I better, I better, I better do something radical from God right now. So for those of you who think it's prideful, it's a lot of pressure to know you were born in the same month of Jesus Christ. If he was born May 21st, as, uh, highlighted by our church father from Alexandria, Clement. Okay. Luke chapter two, verse one, Luke chapter two, verse one. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken in the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. Of course, that's Turkey. And everyone went to his own town to read. You had to go back. This is the first. You think Brexit happened here? No, it happened way back then. <laughs> Got to go back to your own hometown and register. See, the census was to count everybody, but you couldn't be counted unless you're in the hometown. So you ever, if you're, I mean, everybody from this part of the world, you got to go back to your country and be counted there. Now, of course, we see what happens in the text. They pick it, right? They protest, right? No, they don't do any of that. They submit to the governing authorities at this particular time, even though they were unspiritual people. It says they go back. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, okay, which would be in the south. It says up, but it's actually technically down south because uh, Judea was the south. Uh, so when it says the Jews killed Jesus, it doesn't mean all Jews because obviously some of them became disciples. It means those from Judea. Those are the ones, okay? Judea is in the south. It says to Bethlehem, to the town of uh, David, because he belonged to the house of the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting child. While they were there, the time came 
for the baby to be born. Jesus came at the right time, didn't he? <laughs> the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn son. She wrapped him and clo- placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. And the church said, amen. Jesus came at the right time. This is interesting here. Rome is taking a census. Why? They wanted people and money. Rome wanted, to, they wanted money to build roads. They also wanted people. They wanted fighting men. They wanted to know, how many fighting men do we got in Rome? You know, I asked that right there. I asked that question in the London church. I'm not fighting sisters. I love sisters. I love fighting sisters. Fighting sisters, don't get mad at me. You're awesome. You're incredible. You're beautiful. I believe we live in a time where I don't like that there are more fighting women than fighting men nowadays. I believe man's purpose is not only to fight for God, but women need men that will fight for them. That, that, that's what we got. That's the church. Got. We got to fight for our sisters. We got to fight for our sisters. And Rome, the world, they want to know how many fighting men. And yet I ask that today. God is asking how many fighting men. And I'm so proud of my brother Abishak. Abishak is, is, is just a, he's a hard fighting soldier on the battlefield. Now he injured his leg, but he's still fighting for the Lord. You say, well, how? He says, hey, I don't want to be an architect. I, want, I don't want to build buildings. I want to build the kingdom. And he's now in the full-time ministry. He wants to be a fighting man for God right there. So Rome is taking the census to get money and people. The very things that we have as a movement, money and people, that's about it. Not much money and, and, and we need more people. And so this was taken at a time which was called Pax Romana, uh, which was perfect. Because it was called a time of peace, Pax Romana. Uh, but it, it really wasn't a peace. It was a peace that was forced by Rome. Okay, we're gonna be on the, it's like an enforced peace. <laughs> so it's kind of, kind of an irony right there. Uh, and so what's crazy is they would basically say, hey, we want everything peaceful. Uh, so we're going to have our military guard force everybody <laughs> to be peaceful. <laughs> and, you know, there's a Roman guard at every corner, every store, uh, everywhere you walk. You got to go this way. You got to go that way. You're blocked from going here. You're blocked from going there. And so Pax Romana did a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, first of all, it was a perfect time for Jesus to show up because Caesar Augustus uh, means us. There, there were inscriptions written about him. He was called the savior of the world. Just like, oh, wait, hold on. What, 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 what? Some guy thinks he's the savior of the world. It's my time to show up. <laughs> and so Jesus comes right when there was a guy called the savior of the world, Caesar Augustus. And so he, that's when he shows up. But the Pax Romana gave the world a few things. It gave the world, dare we say, freedom of movement. You could go anywhere during the Pax Romana. Perfect time to evangelize the world. It gave the world freedom of religion. You could work, Rome didn't care what religion you worship as long as you pay them money, right? So you can worship whatever religion. It gave a road system that made it easy to travel, including sea travel. Pax Romana helped the sea travel at that time. Most importantly, there was a moral search for God at that time. There's a lot of God had been silent. So people are like, what, what's up here, man? And, and, and it was perfect timing for Jesus to show up. And yet I think that timing is now for us in the 21st century. And yet I'm reminded of the German division. I'm reminded of Nazi Germany, 1940. You say, well, what happened then? This is before Nazi Germany tried to take over the world. They did a few things. Number one, they banned church services. They said, it's illegal to go to church. It's illegal to meet together. Number two, they banned national flags. You couldn't hold up the flag and have any patriotic assemblage to another country other than Germany. They tore down historic statues. Hmm. They got rid of historic landmarks, especially the ones they didn't agree with. Hmm. Number five, they got rid of the police force. They said, we got to get rid of the police. You know, we have that going on nowadays. Defund the police force. No, we need to defund the abortion clinics, right? We need to, we need to, we need probably to give the police more money. <laughs> the other thing that is they banned guns. We don't want anybody protecting themselves. And they tried to get rid of God. They created domestic terrorists because they wanted the people to be struck with fear. So fear could cause turmoil and turmoil could cause panic. One thing is to be afraid. It's another thing when people are panicked. When everyone's panicked, you can move masses of people. When people are afraid, hmm, they think a little bit more rational. But when they're panicked, as Germany did, they, they got people to panic. And they used what were called the bully boys, stormtroopers, or in other words, they were called the brown shirts, uh, very uh, similar to Mussolini who had the black shirts. And they used these internal terrorists to really get everybody all worked on up and cause. The, I, I'm sure you know that this sounds... Familiar. You say, it does. Well, Ecclesiastes 1, verse 9 says, there's nothing new under the sun. What has will be again. See, there, there's nothing new that's happening in the 21st century. We just need to know it's the right time for Jesus. The right time for Jesus. Of course, again, he comes while, while Caesar Augustus has got this decree. And of course, uh, 
when, when Caesar Augustus made this whole decree, he, was, he made it from a place called Prim, which is the modern day Turkey. And that's where the inscription is said that he is the savior of the world. And yet God comes at the time where he says, dude, you think you're ruling? I'm overruling. See, when we think we're ruling, God comes to overrule. <laughs> he thought he was ruling. I'm ruling the world. No, you're not. God's coming. <laughs> Jesus comes always at the right time. When you think you're doing, when you think you're so, you know, when you think you're standing firm, I'll never forget. I, I got baptized and I thought I was doing pretty good. I'd done my second feature film. I was on TV. I was out in billboards. Everything was going great. I'm, I'm in multiple relationships. And God's like, it's the right time to come into your life. And he smashed me. <laughs> I got smashed. I lost everything I owned. I lost my apartment, lost my condo. I got caught being unfaithful. I got exposed. I was in a lot of sin. And that's a perfect time. And, I, and in my pride, I thought, let me get my life together. It didn't turn to Jesus. No, no, no. Jesus messed up my life and it was the right time. <laughs> I had no close relationships. And it was awesome because I became a, a baptized disciple. I let Jesus have the Lord of my life. Now, what's powerful here is what it says in verse four. It says, so Joseph went up from the town of Nazareth to Galilee, to Judea, 90 miles, 90 miles. The average journey back then was 20 miles. He goes 90 miles with a heavily pregnant wife. That's just a crank. She cranked. She's, she goes 90 miles on foot, pregnant. Some of us can't even go to the gym for 90 minutes. Some of us can't read, read for 90 minutes. Some of us can't let, let, let me preach for 90 minutes. All of a sudden, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, we're falling away right there. You know? I mean, 90 miles, right? Some of you, when's the last time you prayed for 90 minutes? I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you. Why, why haven't you prayed for 90 minutes? Why not? They go 90 miles. That was radical. They were radical back then. She takes a two week journey while, while she's full term. She's full term. The only person who could serve God like that is somebody who's full time. She, she's full term, but the only one that someone full time. I, I, I just got to lift up. I got to shout out to Rebecca Gray and MJ right there. Also shout out to Mighty Mandy, who's over there in America. She came to help plant the church here. She got on a plane at eight months and came to London. Plane said, don't do it. Disciples said, don't do it. She came to London eight months pregnant and helped us build up the London International Christian Church. Mandy Roan, I still respect you and love you. Uh, this is so radical. They take this super long journey, which was prophesied in Micah chapter five, verse two. And yet that's what it took to get God's will. Sometimes it takes a long journey to fulfill God's will. You know, sometimes we want that elevator Christianity. You know what I mean? Ding! Married. Ding! Baptism. Ding! The world's end. You can't push the elevator. You cannot just pick what floor you want to go to in life. You got to take the stairs. Do, 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 90 miles. Do, do, do. Ding. Husband. No, you need to be pure for a year. Ding. Husband. No, you need to be pure for three years. Ding. Husband. No, you need to be pure for five years. Ding. Okay, now you're pure. Now you're ready for a boyfriend, not even a husband. You know what I mean? We need to take the long journey, the 90 mile journey. What's the 90 mile journey? Remember, the extra mile. Remember, the Jews were forced by the Romans to go the extra mile. It's called the smile mile. See, there was a sign that was set up that said one mile is all you had to go as a Jew. You know, I know, you know, we get later on in the book of Luke talked about going the extra mile. That's actually because by law, you only had to go one mile. But the real Christians went the extra mile. They take the longer journey and it would convict that Roman soldier because you were supposed to carry their bags as a Jew. And now you're carrying the bags of a Roman soldier. You're going the extra mile. And he's like, man, this dude, okay, I, I, what God do you serve? <laughs> the long way. You know, our sister Jen Watkins, she traveled the long way in America. I believe it was about a four or five hour journey just to come to church. I think about our sister Taft, comes all the way out from Wales. She came all the way out, just traveling, fired, more fired up than some disciples that live here, right? I think about that. I think about Frank and Joseph come all the way down from staff from Birmingham. And of course, at the end, it says they have no room for Jesus. Do you have room for Jesus? It says in verse, in verse, uh, it says in verse six, it says while they were at the end, came time for the baby to be born. In verse seven, it says she gave birth to the firstborn son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the end. No room for God. Why? They were preoccupied with government regulations. You know, we live in a time where everybody's preoccupied with government regulations. No room for Jesus. No room for Jesus. It kills me. It kills me. It drives me nuts. People, you need to be, be clean. No, you need to have your sins cleansed. <laughs> Why no? Can you imagine if every store, hey, you've been baptized? 
You had your sins washed away? You had your sins washed away. Everybody, no, no, we, it, we gotta, it, there's this virus going around. It's called sin. It's killing everybody around the world. You can't come in here unless you're a disciple. That would be awesome. <laughs> right. Hey, did your kid a disciple? Even the kids, you need a mask too. <laughs> Even the little ones, you need God too. We think the little ones don't need God. The little ones need God. The young people need God. How do we know? It says here, it says while they were, the time came for the baby to be born, she gave birth to the firstborn. She wrapped him in clothes. It's time to wrap, get, wrap your arms around your kids. It's time for us. It's marriage. We need to wrap our arms around our kids. Why did she wrap him in clothes? The cloth, they were linen straps that Jesus was wrapped. He was wrapped in linen straps and they had salt to, to heal the baby because salt is a, is a healing agent. So the salted loins were, or salted cloths were wrapped around him and they healed him on up. And, and they wrapped him tight and they were, he was wrapped tight so his arms would grow straight. So his limbs would grow straight. So that's why Jesus was wrapped tight so he would grow up straight. Woo, baby. What kind of, are you, you got your hands wrapped around your kids so they grow up straight. Pun intended. It's time to get a wrap on our kids. I asked our shepherds a few questions. I said, do your kids have quiet times? Who spearheads this effort? How often do you look your kids in the eye and tell them that you love them and they are special? Do your kids have chores, hard chores? Is technology bringing your family closer or separating them? Do you teach your children gender roles? What are you doing to help your children grow up social without social media? Do your kids know more about pixels or people? I asked a few more questions. Why? Because as Jesus had a firm wrap around him by his parents, do you have a wrap? Do you have a wrap around your kids? I don't want to put any pressure on them. Why? I put pressure on our kids. <laughs> they know. I said, Mia, you're so cute. She goes, yeah. I go, you know, if you don't become a Christian, you're going straight to hell, Mia. She goes, I know. <laughs> I don't know. And you know what it's done is giving her the fear of God. She has quiet times. She prays. She even tells me she doesn't have good quiet times. And what's happened is I've actually set up a structure that's challenging for me to live under. Because now she asks me, Dad. How you doing? I'm like, oh no, <laughs> I've been doing well with the Lord. You know, you got a little six, seven year old looking you in the eye. You cannot, you go, oh no. You got to go back out there and get a good prayer because you cannot lie to your seven year old little girl. So it's an interesting. I got a tight wrap on her. She's got a tight wrap on me. How's your parenting? Everything your kids are being taught, they're being taught by you. It's time to get a wrap on our children. There's so much more to come, but let's bring it in for a close. Because it's time to shatter the silence. Bold preaching. Not preaching. Bold preaching. Let's go on to chapter three. Now I gotta hit those two nuggets. Go back to chapter two. I gotta hit these two. Look at verse, look at verse 40. It says, and the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. Check that out. It says, and the child grew and became strong. He was filled with wisdom. Jesus was filled with wisdom, but look at verse 52. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men. See, it's not enough to be filled with wisdom. You got to grow in your wisdom. <laughs> you got to grow in your wisdom of God. It's time to grow. It's time to grow. I love the London church. Some of you are so, un some of you are going to fall away, I think. You're so, un you, you, you just have not grown. You're the same person when me and Michelle moved here in 2010. You haven't grown in faith. You haven't been fruitful. In fact, you're a little bit more distant. It's time to grow. It's not just to be filled with wisdom. I've been baptized. You got to grow in your wisdom. Now I'm baptizing. Now I'm doing things that are glorifying God because I know it's time for me to grow. And I'm speaking to those of you that have been around for a long time. So I just wanted to share that. I know it's a little challenging, but it's time for us to hear that. It's time for us to shatter the silence. And that's exactly what John the Baptist does when you get to chapter three. It says this here. It says in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judah, Herod the Tetrarch of Galilee, the brother of Tetrarch of Etria, of Trechinus, and Lysanus, Tetrarch and Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah in the desert. He went into the countryside, into the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the desert, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, every mountain, hill made low, crooked roads shall become straight, rough roads made smooth, and all mankind will see God's salvation. 
John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him. Praise the Lord, brother. You're amazing. You're so encouraging. The Lord has invited you to come to our fellowship today. We really want to encourage you. You're so nice. You're so loving. God loves you. You're special. You're beautiful. You're incredible. No, John didn't say any of that milk toast candy floss, as they say here in America, they call it cotton candy. Here they call it candy floss. No candy floss preaching starts a movement. God used an ordinary rough and crooked. Can you imagine this guy? Later on, he says he's eating bugs and everything. He's out there. He's got bugs in his teeth. He's got locusts. He's out there. He's like, and you see, you see these Pharisees who were paid by the government, the Roman government. That's why the Pharisees didn't like Jesus very much because they had their, they got their finances from the government. Right. That's why they were mad at Jesus messing up their money and messing up their, their religion. And so he's got John the Baptist got bugs in his teeth and everything. He's got some, he's, a, he's a hippie. He's got this belt around, around his waist. He thinks he's Elijah because Elijah had the leather belt around his waist. He's probably smelling a little tart right there. He's out in the desert, not in. The, I mean, he's in the desert. All the priests were trained in the temple. John was brought up different. He was brought up in the desert. And he's out there and he's preaching a radical message. He shattered the silence of 400 years. I read that and said, man, why are people going out to hear this guy tell him? He calls him, he said, you brood of you snakes. <laughs> he calls him snakes. You're satanic. He calls him Satan. He says, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. John starts his sermon with a scathing rebuke. I was like, man, what made people leave the cool confines of Jerusalem to go out and be told how terrible they are? <laughs> In the desert, they eat. You know, of course, there's a great story of David Hume, who hated Christians. This guy is known for hating. He says, I hate Christianity. I hate Christians. And he would travel on horseback 75 miles to hear one of the greatest speakers of all Christendom speak, Charles Spurgeon an Englishman. And he would get there. He, he didn't believe in God, but he'd get there. And one morning he gets to the place where Spurgeon was going to speak that morning. And someone who was part of Spurgeon's church saw him. You're David Hume. <laughs> you don't even believe in what Charles Spurgeon is teaching and you've come here. You don't believe in any of it. I know you don't believe. Why are you here? He says, because he does. Because he does. That atheist was so inspired by a man who knew what he believed in. Who knew why he believed in him. And that happened right here in England. He says, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. You know, trees are not made for landscaping in the Bible. And so disciples aren't made for, you know, we don't want any landscape disciples. You know how you get trees that look really nice in the landscape. They're there. There's no fruit. They're there. There's no impact. They're there. They're just there. They're just in the landscape. I don't want to be a landscape disciple. I don't want to be a landscape world sector where we look great. We're in the landscape. Got to, you know, we look there. There's no fruit. But it's, we've been having some fruit. We're going for 100 bats. And so I'm excited about that. But what, what, what's so special is what can start a movement. What inspired these people to leave Jerusalem and go to a desert is a man who had bold preaching. The, that, that, it's impossible to leave the comforts of awesome Jerusalem and go out to the desert unless you hear a message you aren't hearing everywhere. If you come to our channel, you come to our church, we believe a few things. We believe Jesus died, he lived a sinless life and rose from the dead. We believe if you are not a Christian, you are going to hell. You are not gonna go to hell, you are gonna go to hell. We don't, we're not waiting for judgment to come as it's taught in Matthew chapter 24, the final judgment. We know that people are judged every two seconds because people die every two seconds. And we are afraid. We don't want to go to hell, but we are afraid. We are not wanting to miss out on going to heaven. <laughs> we know it's going to be amazing when we're up there in heaven and only on earth do we have a little slice. It's going to take brothers to shatter the silence. It's time for us to shatter the silence. It's time for us to shatter the silence in our quiet times. It's time for us to shatter the silence in our Bible talks. Some of our Bible talks are too silent. It's time for us to shatter the silence in London. It's time for the entire London church to be seen in all of London, London as the pillar for all of Christianity and all of Europe.
And we're going to all nations. We're going to Portugal. We're going to Scotland, but then we're going to Poland. We're going to Germany. We're going to Italy. We are coming. It is time to God be all the glory. Our God is an awesome God. God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is Our an God awesome is God. Awesome. He reigns from, he heaven, reigns from above heaven above with wisdom, with power, power, and love. Wisdom. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is, Our God an awesome, God. is awesome. He reigns from, he reigns from heaven, heaven with, with power and wisdom. Our God is an awesome God. God is Our God is awesome. He reigns from, he reigns from heaven with, with power and wisdom. Our God is an awesome God. Now when he rolled up his sleeves, he wasn't putting on the ritz. Our God is an awesome God. He's got thunder in his footsteps and lightning in his fist. Our God is an awesome God. The Lord wasn't kidding when he kicked him out of Eden. It wasn't for no reason that he shed his blood. His return is very soon, and so you'll better be believing. Our that. God is an awesome God. Don't you know that he's awesome? Our God is awesome. And he from heaven, with power and wisdom, with power and wisdom. Yeah, our God is an awesome God. Don't you know that He's awesome? Our God is awesome, and He reigns with power and wisdom. With power and wisdom, our God is an awesome God. Now in the sky, we're starless in the void of the night. Our God is an awesome God. He spoke into the darkness, created the light. Our God is an awesome God. The judgment and wrath He poured out on Sodom. His mercy and grace He gave us at the cross. I hope that you have not too quickly forgotten. Our, our God, God is an awesome God. Don't you know that our God, our God is awesome? And He reigns. He reigns from heaven. With power and wisdom. With our God is an awesome God. Don't you know that He's awesome? Our God is awesome, and He reigns, he reigns from heaven with power and wisdom. With power and wisdom. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. Wow, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's service. And then just going straight in. Oh man, when Michael said that when Zachariah had an encounter with God and he was left speechless, that's how I feel right now. I'm a little bit speechless. I don't really have the words to say about it's time. It's time that I change. It's time that you change. Because it's time that God has spoken to us. Right, right here, right now, this morning, I feel so challenged. Because this really is the time. And the first question I asked myself when Michael was preaching was like, what if God decides that it's time to come back right now? I've not done enough. I've not made the decision to break the silence. And I'm a coward. And I feel so deeply challenged by, by my namesake, Sir William Ramsey. My, William is my middle name. I feel so challenged by him because that's my exact history. I wanted to challenge the Bible. I came up to the Bible going, you know what? The only way that I can prove this is wrong is by doing it and showing the Christians that it doesn't work. And I did that and I was fooled within a couple of days. <laughs> and William Ramsey became a powerful preacher. Charles Spurgeon was a powerful preacher. This is my history. This is the great nation of England and I have let this country down by not breaking the silence as much as I should. I'm going to come after you guys. 
you remnant, you Welsh, Scottish, Irish, all those guys in England, Liverpool, Manchester, down in Devon, I'm coming after you. I'm going to break the silence. I don't know how, but I'm just so grateful that God does. <laughs> and so I had to go take a prayer after that. So I'm so grateful that, that God is going to be able to change my character because it's time I stop being English and start being English. Stop being English emotionally and start being the Englishman for Englishmen, wielding my King Arthur kind of sword and, and breaking the silence. I'm so grateful that God spoke through Michael today. I know that I'm very challenged and I really want to go after it, but I'd love to hear what my fiance has to say. Go on, Frankie. Amen. It is time to seek God. Oh my goodness. This is the time. If there's any time right now living through a pandemic is to seek God. The most prideful thing to do is not to seek God, is to go by our own strength. And God has humbled the whole nations. What better time? So many people have lost their jobs. They're not in education. We can't rely on anything else. Everything in the world is fleeting except God. Yet we're not seeking God. And I'm speaking from personal experience of my personal relationship with God. I've been spending three hours with him in the morning, but that's not enough. I'm so grateful. Luke discipled me. He said, you need to spend more time with God. And I do all of yesterday. I spent hours praying with God, more than three hours. We've been challenged to pray for 90 minutes. We need to pray all day long to God. I really challenge you sisters, please don't go by your own strength. Now is the time for us to seek God and to, spy, and to inspire others. We are the light of the world. We need to show people the light of Jesus, the one God of this world. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Frankie. She's totally right. <laughs> it's time, guys. There's, there's no better, better sermon. There's no better title. Because if you think about the, the Pax Romana and everything that, that was going on at that time, what better time is right now? where we've got access to all nations. We're in a click of a button. I think about the first century church. I'm like, dang, those guys did it on foot. We don't even need to move. Michael is preaching the word to, to the whole world right here, God. Samuel has been doing it. Caspar has been doing it. We've all had a chance to share God's word and it's hitting everybody around the world. We don't have to move. We don't have to get in on chariot. We don't have to do anything. And people are coming to us. But it really is the time for us to, to make huge change. Huge change in the UK, huge change in all of Europe and huge change around the whole world. If you want to be part of that, if you want to be part of the generation that says it's time to see the world evangelized, please like us, share us, comment, but better yet still come to us physically. My address is, I'm not going to tell you, <laughs> but you're going to come down. You know where we are. Follow us and get to be part of it. It is time. We love you. Thank you so much and see you next week. We present you with an AMS original, The Name of Jesus. The plan of God before creation The death of Christ and resurrection He sacrificed for our redemption The blood He shed for our salvation And we confess and declare that He is our Savior, the Lord of our lives, the King, our Creator Alpha and Omega, beginning and the end, our Father and our friend. We give you the glory, for you are worthy. The whole world should know the name, the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. The name of Jesus, the name of Jesus. There is power in the name. The name of Jesus we proclaim. To break free all our chains. 
find purpose in our pain And we confess and declare He is our Savior The Lord of our lives The King, our Creator Alpha and Omega Beginning and the end Our Savior and our friend We give you the glory The whole world should know the name, the name of Jesus. We give you the glory, for you are worthy. The whole world should know the name, the name of Jesus. 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 You are the light of the world. You are, yeah, the Emmanuel. You are, yeah, the one we beheld. You're our father and our friend. You are, yeah, Emmanuel. You are. Yeah, the light of the world, you are, yeah, the one we beheld, you're our father and our friend. We give you the glory, for you are worthy, the whole world should know the name, the name of Jesus. The whole world should know the name, the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus.